morning. I'm a little early. Oh well. Was, hmm. Something else I saw said it was seven o'clock. So. Oh well. We'll go ahead and start. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit exalts in God my Savior, for he has looked with mercy this new day. Lord, we ask you for the gift of peace. And even in the midst of a crazy, troubled world, Lord, the peace that only you can give. And we thank you. Amen. He has mercy. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all having a great day. So far, or maybe you're just still in bed. I won't tell. I'm a little jealous. <laughs> so it's a chilly, bit of a chilly start this morning, which is I have a cozy sweater. I'm very excited about that. So if you, um, we're still only at 48. I'm gonna give people a little more more time to jump on. So I hope you're all doing well. I know I had some friends who had some damage in the storm, um, especially those who have houses on the Gulf Coast in Mississippi. So I'm so sorry. That's kind of the price of living on the Gulf Coast, right? I always ask, like, what were my ancestors thinking of coming here all those generations ago to the swamp? But here we are. And God is good. 
So we are picking up again today, Searching for and Maintaining Peace by Father Jacques Philippe. We're on page 58. And I believe I left off, I started on my story about, um, I just part, part of my story about the Lord inviting me to stop the crazy yo-yo dieting and the abusive boot camps and all of that. And then I gained 40 pounds in the process, which was really, really scary. But then finally, 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 I really got it that God loved me and that's all I really needed. And that's really the truth. It's so hard for us sometimes to interiorize that God really loves us as we are. We don't have to perform for that love. We don't have to be a certain size for that love. He doesn't care. No, he just loves us and he wants us to receive that love now. Now. And not when we get to some perfect place. That's not how God's love works. That might be how human love works sometimes, but not how his love works. And so I want to respond actually to, um, while we're waiting for people to jump on, I don't remember who it was, forgive me, but someone sent me a message on Instagram and said they were confused because I said that the Lord was inviting me to stop the crazy yo-yo dieting. And then um, he invited me to let my only bread be his body and my only wine be his precious blood. So carbs and alcohol, those have been sort of the two things that I would use um, just emotional eating, right? It was an old, old, hard groove habit in my brain. And so like the first 10 pounds, so that I did that. And so like the first 10 pounds I lost just by not eating the bread, the sugar and the alcohol. And, um, and then a friend of mine told me about Optavia. So I did it. That is a diet. And so she said that she had done Optavia and then was gaining the weight back. So for me, I think what the difference was, um, was that one, I wasn't super rigid about it. And it was just a tool for me to help take care of my body because, but to, I did it gently and I needed to learn temperance and how to fix meals that were really healthy. So those were the, that was the virtue I was working on with, was temperance. And I thought of it more of as, as a spiritual fast. So I was offering up my hunger each day for particular intentions but that may like be the kind of thing that really hangs up people and because you know most diets in the long run do fail and i i know that for a fact because i've done them all <laughs> just about all of them and for me though it was just growing in the virtue of temperance and um, spiritual fasting so that was the difference for me it was not abusive it wasn't um, because I needed the, to try and manipulate people into loving me. So that is where the freedom really came for for me. And so I still occasionally use the food from Optavia. Um, if I, because I'm always going to have until I'm like fully healed and completely virtuous, a temptation to overindulge. And it makes me feel bad and my clothes don't fit. And, um, so it's, it's complicated, <laughs> but again, it's the difference of a diet mentality, um, versus growing in temperance. And so, but there is a beautiful website called, um, findingbalance.com. That's very, it would be totally opposed to Optavia. It would totally oppose to really any diets. Um, because there can be so much extra stuff wrapped up in that old woundedness, addictions, self-harming behavior, and so, and shame. So it's called findingbalance.com. And so for those of you who have been yo-yo dieters your whole life and you're trying to get out off of that and like just actually enter into the rest of the Lord and learn how to cultivate temperance and to care for the temple and bless the temple that is our body then finding balance I find is really good. And I get a little daily e email from them every day. Okay. But they don't really go into fasting or spiritual fasting because that is a trigger for so many people, especially if you struggled with anorexia. Fasting is not good if you have struggled with anorexia. It is a trigger and can get you back into anorexia. So you look for other ways, other ways to offer, make of your bodies a living sacrifice. Maybe it's by serving others. Okay. Back to 
searching for and maintaining peace. But I thought that was an important point to make. And I'm glad to see so many more people back today. I'm guessing you didn't have power yesterday. So the video recording from yesterday is available. And um, I'm glad to see you. And I hope you're all doing okay. All right. So I believe we were at the top of page 58. I'm just going to start go back to the bottom of page 57. God acts in the peace of one's soul. It is not by our own efforts that we succeed in liberating ourselves from sin. It is only the grace of God which attains this end. Only the grace of God. Rather than troubling ourselves, it's more efficacious to regain our peace when we fall, we stumble. We, once again, we did the same thing we promised we wouldn't do anymore. It's more efficacious to regain our peace and let God act. The second reason is that this is more pleasing to God. What is more pleasing to God? It is when, after experiencing a failure, we are discouraged and tormented, or when we react by saying, Lord, I ask your pardon. I have sinned again. This, alas, is what I am capable of doing on my own. But I abandon myself with confidence to your mercy and your pardon. I thank you for not allowing me to sin even more grievously. I abandon myself to you with confidence because I know that one day you will heal me completely. And in the meantime, I ask you that the experience of my misery would cause me to be more humble. Wow. So growing in that virtue of humility, even more important. Goodbye. I love you. Oh my gosh. She's dressed. I can't even tell you. Mm Mm-mm. She's wearing a costume today. It's scary. Though she says it really shouldn't be scary. Okay, can I just tell y'all? My child is dressed as a plague doctor. Because she's like, Mom, they came to bring healing to people. And I'm like, "Mm." yeah, it's quite a costume. Okay. (laughs) I abandon myself to you with confidence because I know that one day you will heal me completely. And in the meantime... I ask you that the experience of my misery would cause me to be more humble, more considerate of others, more conscious that I can do nothing by myself, but that I must rely solely on your love and your mercy. The response is clear. The third reason is that the trouble, the sadness, and the discouragement that we feel regarding our failures and our faults are rarely pure. They are not very often the simple pain of having offended God. They are in good part mixed with pride. We are not sad and discouraged so much because God was offended, but because the ideal image that we have of ourselves has been brutally shaken. Our pain is very often that of wounded pride. Whoa. So why do people resist going to confession? Pride. Pride alone. But that gift of compunction of heart, where it's like real true sorrow for wounding the one who has loved you so tenderly, so madly, standing with you, always with you, just waiting for a glance from you. You know, sorrow for wounding that one, that Jesus who loves you so much. That's compunction of heart, and that is a grace from God. But usually the pain when we go to confession is our wounded bride. So we ask for that grace of true compunction, true sorrow for wounding him who loved us, has loved us, and loves us so much. This excessive pain is actually a sign that we have put our trust in ourselves, in our own strength, and not in God. Listen to Dom Lorenzo Scupoli. That was a fun name. Lorenzo Scupoli, whom we have already cited. A presumptuous man believes with certainty that he has acquired a distrust of himself and confidence in God, which are the foundations of the spiritual life, and therefore that which one must make an effort to acquire. But this is an error that we never recognize better than when we've just experienced a failure. Because then, if one is troubled by it, if one feels afflicted by it, if it causes one to lose all hope of making new progress in virtue— This is a sign that one has placed all his confidence, not in God, but in himself. And the greater the sadness and despair, the more one must judge himself guilty. Hmm. But let's not despair about that. Because he who mistrusts himself greatly and who puts great confidence in God, if he commits some fault, is hardly surprised. 
He's neither disturbed nor chagrined because he clearly sees, sees clearly that this is the result of his weakness and the little care he took to establish his confidence in God. His failure, on the contrary, teaches him to distrust even more his own strength and to put even greater trust in the help of him who alone has power. He detests above all his sin. He condemns the passion or vicious habit which was the cause. He conceives a sharp pain for having offended his God. But his pain is always subdued and does not prevent him from returning to his primary occupations, to bear with his familiar trials and to battle until death with his cruel enemies. It is again a very common illusion to attribute to a feeling of virtue this fear and trouble that one experiences after a sin. Because though the uneasiness that follows the sin is always accompanied by some pain, still it does not proceed only from a source of pride or from a secret presumption caused by too great a confidence in one's own strength. Thus, then, whoever believes himself affirmed in virtue is contemptuous toward temptations and comes to understand by the sad experience of his failures that he is fragile and a sinner like others, is surprised as if by something that never should have happened, and deprived of the feeble feeble support on which he was counting, he allows himself to succumb to chagrin and despair. Woe is me. This misfortune never happens to those who are humble, who do not presume on themselves, and who rely only on God. When they have failed, they are neither surprised nor chagrined, because the light of truth which illuminates them makes them see that it is a natural result of their weakness and their inconstancy. So, that's from The Spiritual Combat and a Treatise on Peace of Soul by William Lester and Robert Mohan. Point number 14. God can draw good even from our faults. The fourth reason for which this sadness and discouragement are not good is that we must not view our own faults too tragically because God is able to draw good from them. Little Therese of the Child Jesus loved greatly this phrase of St. John of the Cross. Love is able to profit from everything, the good as well as the bad, that it finds in me and to transform it into itself. Hmm. And that's a capital I. So love is able to profit from everything, the good as well as the bad that God finds in me and to transform the bad in me into himself. Our confidence in God must go at least that far to believe that he is good enough and powerful enough to draw good from everything, 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 everything including our faults and our infidelities. When he cites the phrase of St. Paul, everything works together for the good of those who love God, St. Augustine adds, etiam peccata, even sins can work for the good. Of course, we must struggle energetically against sin and correct our imperfections. God vomits the tepid. That's what scripture says. I will vomit you out of my mouth. We don't want to be there. And nothing cools love quite like resigning oneself to mediocrity. This resignation is, by the way, a lack of confidence in God and his ability to sanctify us. When we have been the cause of some evil, we must also try to rectify it to the extent that it is possible. But we must not distress ourselves excessively regarding our faults. I'm just bringing to mind... um, the 12 steps in, um, in Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon, all of that, it's really basically the Christian walk that we all have to go to. And making a fearless moral inventory is one of those steps. And it's like when you go to make a, a general confession, a fearless moral inventory in the light of God's love and mercy. Not condemning, not hating yourself, but let me just see, like, where have I not corresponded to God's love? that fearless moral inventory, and to, if we have done things to harm people that we have not rectified with an apology, if nothing else, then we need to do that. That is part of our Christian walk. But we must not distress ourselves excessively regarding our faults, because God, once we return to him with a contrite heart, is able to cause good to spring forth. 
if only to make us grow in humility and to teach us to have a little less confidence in our own strength and a little more in him alone. So think about the times when you had to apologize to someone for for being a jerk or whatever. You did something wrong. That when you make a sincere apology from the heart, when you humble yourself before someone and they receive your apology and sometimes maybe even apologize themselves, is not the relationship at an even higher level of intimacy at that point. That's how God uses our sin to bring us to even higher virtue. More humility. So great is the mercy of the Lord that he uses our faults to our advantage. Ruizbruck, a Flemish mystic of the Middle Ages, has these words. The Lord in his clemency wanted to turn our sins against themselves and in our favor, He found a way to render them useful, to convert them in our hands into instruments of salvation. This should in no way diminish our fear of sinning, nor our pain at having sinned. Rather, our sins have become for us a source of humility. Amen. Let us add also that they can just as well become a source of tenderness and mercy toward others. I, who fall so easily, how can I permit myself to judge my brother? How can I not be merciful toward him as the Lord has been toward me? Accordingly, after committing a fault of whatever kind, rather than withdrawing into ourselves indefinitely in discouragement and dwelling on the memory, we must immediately return to God with confidence and even thank him for the good that his mercy will be be able to draw out of this fault. Wow. Wow. I'm thinking about um, the two priests who have just been removed from ministry, from their, their, their faculties as priests has been withdrawn in the Archdiocese of New Orleans for grievous offenses. And so my prayer for them, I mean, of course, my prayer is for the victims first. But my prayer for them is that they not despair of God's mercy. And I'm just thinking, like, what would... What would this one particular priest, what would he be thinking if he were to read this? Because is there a greater sin or scandal? I mean, Catholic priests are held to a higher standard. And how many people like just want to leave the faith? And so if I were that kind of, if I had committed that kind of a public sin where it felt like the whole world hated me in many ways they do, Accordingly, after committing a fault of whatever kind, rather rather than withdrawing and dwelling on it, we must immediately return to God with confidence. That would be so hard. And even thank him for the good that his mercy will be able to draw out of this fault. So Lord Jesus, I'm just looking at him in the divine mercy. Lord, we ask for these sins that have caused so much scandal that you, in your mercy, you would draw good out of them in your own mysterious way, not only for all of the faithful who have been scandalized, for all of the victims who have been wounded so egregiously, but even for the perpetrators, Lord. Amen. We must know that one of the weapons that the devil uses most commonly to prevent souls from advancing toward God is precisely to try to make them lose their peace, and discourage them by the sight of their faults. It is necessary that we know how to distinguish true repentance and a true desire to correct our faults, which is always gentle, peaceful, trustful, from a false repentance, from that remorse that troubles, discourages, and paralyzes. I need to read that again. It is necessary that we know how to distinguish true repentance and a true desire to correct our faults, which is always gentle, peaceful, trustful, from a false repentance, okay, from the remorse that troubles, discourages, and paralyzes. So those are the two different kinds of repentance. One is peaceful, gentle, gentle, and trusting. The other is troubled, discouraged, and paralyzed. Not all of the reproaches that come to our conscience are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Some of them come from our pride or the devil. And we must learn to discern them. That discernment of spirits is a great gift of the Holy Spirit. Peace is an essential criterion in the discernment of spirits. 
the feelings that come from the Spirit of God can be very powerful and profound. Nonetheless, they are always peaceful. Let us listen again to Scupoli. To preserve our hearts in perfect tranquility, it is still necessary to ignore some interior feelings of remorse which seem to come from God because they are reproaches that our conscience makes to us regarding true faults, but which come in effect from the evil spirit as can be judged by what ensues. If the twinges of conscience serve to make us more humble, if they tender us, I'm sorry, render us more fervent in the practice of good works, if they do not diminish the trust that one must have in divine mercy, we must accept them with thanksgiving as favors from heaven. But if they trouble us, if they dishearten us, if they render us lazy, timid, slow to perform our duties, we must believe that these are suggestions of the enemy and do things in a normal way, not deigning to listen to them. And he has that bolded. Let us understand this, says Father Jacques Philippe. For the person of goodwill, that which is serious in sin is not so much the fault in itself as the despondency into which it places him. He who falls but immediately gets up has not lost much. He has rather gained in humility and in the experience of mercy. He who remains sad and defeated loses much more. The sign of spiritual progress is not so much never falling as it is in being able to lift oneself up quickly after one falls. Okay, 724, perfect time to end. We'll pick up with point 15 tomorrow. So we don't have a whole lot left. I'm guessing maybe another week in this book and then we'll be done. So if you would like to continue with me in the Jacques Philippe book studies, I my intent is to read them all and just to have that available on YouTube indefinitely because they've given me permission and because I'm learning them by reading them out loud. So the next one we're going to do is Time for God. There's so many good ones and everyone has, I've gotten... Every one of his book titles has been sent to me as an email. Please do this one next, but including Time for God. And to me, this is just a foundational. Oh, look what I just found. <laughs> oh, I'll show you in a second. I, last time I was reading this book looks like it was 11 years ago. And anyway, this is so foundational. Time for God. We have to make time for him every day in prayer that's the foundation and then we can get to the others so we'll do this next and i'm hoping we finish this up in in november and then on with the start of advent on the feast of christ the king november 29th we will start the read of god by carol houselander c-a-r-y-l-l house lander l-a-n-d-e-r the read of god beautiful book for advent which i've never read cover to cover so i can't wait to do it with you so Time for God, if you want to pick that one up, we'll maybe order it today. I would encourage you to if you want to start it with us. But look what I just found in my book. You're going to read it backwards. But a little note from Ceci. And it says, God good is a good God. He is God. Is and then hearts. God, oh, God is hearts and hearts and hearts and hearts. So God is love. Ceci Age 5, Our Lady of the Lake Adoration Chapel, August 5th, 2009. He is a good God. I love that that was a little present for me in my book. So it's been a long time since I've read it, and it's time for me time for me to read Time for God. But now, look at like all the notes that I wrote in here and the underlines and the stars. It's so good. All right, so we'll do that next. Um, okay, I am going to end this in a song. And then I'm going to go sing for Mass again. Um, pray, prayer for Robert Simpson. Um, he is in probably in surgery right now. Robert is a dear friend, father of five young kids, has pancreatic cancer. Robert's in his early 40s. His, aunt, his wife, Anne, is a, the music director at St. Peter. So I'm going to go... Um, Stand in for her for Mass today at 8.30 at St. Peter's, if anybody wants to join me. Yesterday, by the way, 
there was no electricity in Covington and much of Covington. And so mass was by candlelight. It was so beautiful. It was really beautiful. We had no microphones, nothing. So that opera training really helped project. Anyway, so I'm going to offer my mass for, um, for Robert and just ask that you keep in your prayers. It's hard. Okay. So, um, hmm. I think for Robert, I'm just going to play, I place my trust in you. This is from my Divine Mercy CD, The Miracle of Divine Mercy, written by Precious Kara Klein for her brother when he was dying. Here we go. I'm going to read your comments. I place my trust in you. Michael Marie. Glad you're here. You lost your roof. Oh my gosh. Susan, I'm so sorry. I place my faith in you, O Lord. I place my faith in you. Book study, yeah, no book study on the weekends. Um, and yes, we're still doing the sacrifice beads. I'm just waiting for all of those supplies to arrive. And we will give you all the details and the options. So hold off on sending me money. Some people have started that already. If you wouldn't mind, just hold off so that I can keep my act together. Because <laughs> I'm not really set up for that yet. Um, Maureen just said that Barbara's funeral is this morning. Barbara, who prayed... Um, the 33 days with us. May she rest in peace. And thank you for all the prayers for Robert. Sorry about the glitches with the reception. I'm guessing that's just because of the hurricane. It happened with YouTube during the rosary. So if that happens again, if the video freezes, I'm told that if you go out of the app, and come back in, whether it's YouTube or Instagram, that the video will come back up. I didn't have any pauses on my end, so I'm hoping that when I post it, it will be there without the pauses. Thank you for your prayers for Robert. So glad, Adrian, your kids like my music. Yay! All right. For all of your prayer intentions. Thank you, Eileen. Okay, great. So, um, wonderful Christmas present idea, right? Is the books of Father Jacques Philippe. All right, have a great day. I will see you tomorrow, and I'm headed to Mass if you want to join me. St. Peter's in Covington, 830. Much love.